This is the second video over the Jacobian. We're asked to evaluate a double integral over the region R of this function um, using this transformation. X equals the square root of V over U and Y equals the square root of U times V. Um, so again, remember what the Jacobian does for us. Basically, it takes integration over a complicated region and it makes it um, a double double integration over a simpler region. Um, this might be challenging over the original region R that was given to us, but with the transformation, the new region of integration might be very simple. Um, so let's first sketch the region R and then sketch the image of the region R under the transformation. Then we can see if using the Jacobian is a good idea. And it turns out that it is. So they tell us that R is the region in the first quadrant lying between Y equals 1 fourth X. So that is a line. Excuse me. Uh, that is a line with a slope of 1 fourth that passes through the origin. So we go up one and over four. We've also got the line y equals two x. Also passes through the origin. So we go up one and over two. Maybe up one and over two again. And then you've got the line y equals one over x. Now when x is one, we're on the curve y equals one over x, y equals one. And we know that generally this is the shape of it. I did not figure out exactly where it's going to cross. So this graph might not be just not may not be quite right. And then I've got y equals four over x. So if y is four over x, when x is one, y is four. And when x is four, y is one. It's gonna look like this. So this is our region R of integration. You can see right away that you probably don't want to integrate over R. But we're hoping that through our transformation, and they gave us the transformation this time, the new region S will be simpler. So remember what the, the equations of these curves are. This is Y equals a four over X. This is Y equals one over X and so on. And we probably do need to know what those points of intersection are. Well, I know that when x is 4, if y is 1 fourth x, y is 1. And when x is 4, if y is 4 over x, we get 4 over 4, which is 1. So that is the point of x equals 4, y equals 1. Then this one, that point of intersection can be found by setting y equals 4 over x equal to 2x. Oops, y equals 2x, and you've got y equals 4 over x, and you want to set those equal to each other and solve for x. So maybe multiply both sides by x, divide both sides by 2. In general, we'd have x equals plus or minus the square root of 2, but we know we're in quadrant 1. So that's x equals square root of 2. y equals 2 root 2. That makes sense. 2 times root 2 is 2 root 2. And if I take 4 and I divide it by square root of 2, I get 2 root 2. Okay. Now I need this point. I need to know where y equals 2x meets y equals 1 over x. 
So I set those y's equal to each other. Multiply both sides by x. Then you get x squared is 1 half, or x equals um, square root of 1 half, or 1 over square root of 2. Or if you prefer, you can call it square root of 2 over 2. So x is square root of 2 over 2. y is twice that, so it's y is square root of 2. And also, if I take the reciprocal of this, I get that, so that's good. That's the right point. And then I need to set y equals 1 fourth x equal to y equals 1 over x. Actually, I might think of it this way and cross multiply. So we'll get x squared equals 4. So x equals plus or minus 2. That means, must mean x is 2 here. If x is 2 and y equals 1 over x, y must be 1 half. Let's make sure that also satisfies this equation. Is 1 fourth of 2 1 half? It sure is. Okay. So those are our points of intersection. Those are going to be helpful whenever we describe or we look at the transformation of this region. We want to see what this region is under the transformation. So under the transformation given by these equations, um, each of these curves um, are going to correspond to new curves in the UV plane. So let's, let's find out what those curves are. Y equals 2x. The line y equals 2x can be described this way under the new transformation. y is the square root of u times v. x is the square root of v over u. Now it might be helpful to write this differently. Um, maybe I'll write that as u to the 1 half times v to the 1 half. And over here I've got v to the 1 half over u to the 1 half. Let's multiply both sides by u to the 1 half. So I get this, provided v is not zero, I can divide by v to the one half. In that case, u is equal to two. So I'm going to put a little asterisk there, a little star to remind myself, I assumed that v wasn't zero. I need to make sure v is not zero. Okay, so that was y equals two x. We also had y equals one fourth x. We're going to see a lot of that, that same pattern that we had over here, here, because it's a line, and that was a line. The only difference is this one has a 2 in it, this one has a 1 fourth in it. So I bet this corresponds to u equals 1 fourth. So let's prove it to ourselves. y is u to the 1 half times v to the 1 half. And I've got 1 fourth of uh, v to the 1 half over u to the 1 half. Let's multiply both sides by 4 times u to the 1 half. So we've got 4u equals this. And if we divide both sides by v to the 1 half, assuming that v is not 0, we get 4u equals 1. Or if I solve for u, get u by itself, I get u equals 1 fourth. OK. So provided v is not 0, u goes from 1 fourth to 2. Okay, now let's look at the other two equations. I had y equals 1 over x and y equals 4 over x. Actually, it might be simpler if I think of it this way. y equals 1 over x is the same as xy equals 1. x is v to the 1 half over u to the 1 half. y is u to the 1 half times v to the 1 half. We have that set equal to 1. The u is reduced provided u is not 0, and it's not because u is going between 1 fourth and 2. And we end up with v equals 1 there. So it turns out that x times y turns up, ends up being v. 
and that's our, our one. Similarly, if we solve this, or if we multiply both sides by x on this equation, we get xy equals 4. So we're going to have v equals 4. Because from this, we found out that xy was equal to v. So it turns out we are integrating over a rectangle again, even though that region R that we started with was very complicated looking. V goes from 1 to 4, and U goes from 1 fourth to 2. That's nice. <coughs> Excuse me. That's the region S. Okay, and we need three things whenever we convert a double integral. I'm using the Jacobian. We need new bounds, and we just found them. The next thing we need is a new integrand. And then we need a new DA. Now our original integrand was e to the negative xy over 2. Well, we found out earlier that x times y was v to the 1 half over u to the 1 half times u to the 1 half times v to the 1 half. Those reduced x times y just equals v in general under this transformation. So we get e to the negative v over 2 as our new integrand in terms of u and v. OK, we've got bounce, we've got a new integrand. The last thing we need is a new dA. And to find dA, we need the Jacobian of this transformation. Fortunately, we were given it this time, so it's not too bad. We just need to um, compute the Jacobian of that. dA is the absolute value of the Jacobian of the transformation times du dV. And x was the square root of v over u. So that's v to the 1 half. And to make it easier, I'm going to bring that u to the 1 half up to the numerator, call that u to the negative 1 half make it easier to differentiate. y was the square root of u times v. That's u to the 1 half, v to the 1 half. OK. So now we just need partials with respect to u and v for each of these guys. Partial of x with respect to u is negative 1 half, u to the negative 3 halves. v to the 1 half is a constant. The partial of x with respect to v is 1 half v to the 1 half minus 1 is negative 1 half times that u to the negative 1 half. That was a constant. I'm taking the partial of y with respect to u, treating v to the 1 half as a constant, so I can bring that constant down. The derivative of u to the 1 half is 1 half u to the negative 1 half. And the partial of y with respect to v, I treat u as a constant, so I bring that down. And then I differentiate v to the 1 half. So it's 1 half v to the negative 1 half. OK, so now we're going to put those pieces together. All those partial derivatives belong in our um, Jacobian. Partials with, of x with respect to u and v in the first row. Partial of y with respect to u and v, those two first partials in the second row. We get this.
multiply across the diagonal. We have this times this. Let's get negative one fourth. U to the negative three halves times u to the one half. You add the exponent. It's going to give you u to the negative one. V to the negative or v to the one half times v to the negative one half. You add the exponents there as well. That's v to the zero, which we know is one. You multiply across this diagonal now and subtract. So we'll have minus one fourth v to the one half times v to the negative one half is another v to the zero. And u to the negative one half times u to the negative one half, add the exponents, that's u to the negative one. Of course, the v to the zeros are one, and so we end up with negative two fourths, which is negative one half, u to the negative one, or if you prefer, put that u in the denominator, that's negative one over two u. Okay, so the Jacobian is the absolute value of that. times du dv, and you can take out the one half if you want to. Now we have to keep those absolute value bars there just in case u happens to be negative in our um, bounds. If u is not negative, u is positive all the time, we can eliminate those absolute value bars later. Okay, so we needed three things. We needed new bounds, we've got them. A new integrand, we've got it. We needed a new DA, and we have our new DA right here. We put all those pieces together to rewrite our double integral now. I've got the double integral over R of e to the negative xy over two DA. U goes from 1 fourth to two v goes from 1 to 4. My new integrand was e to the negative v over 2. And my new dA is 1 half of the absolute value of 1 over u. And these were bounds for u. So we're integrating with respect to u first and then v. The order doesn't really matter because the bounds are constant. We just have to be consistent. These bounds go with this innermost variable. These bounds go with the outermost variable. And notice that our u values are going from 1 fourth to 2, or we're here. So u is always positive. That's the u axis. So there's no need for this absolute value. And now we can evaluate the integral. So we'll do the innermost integral first, and then work our way out. This is constant, and that's constant with respect to u. The antiderivative of 1 over u is natural log of the absolute value of u. We'll sub in u equals 1 fourth, and u equals 2, and subtract. So have natural log of 2 minus natural log of 1 fourth dv. And this can be simplified a little bit. <coughs> 1 half is a constant. And remember from algebra class, natural log of a minus natural log of b is natural log of a over b. So it's natural log of 2 divided by 1 fourth or eight. We're still integrating e to the negative v over two with respect to v. The antiderivative of e to some power is e to that power. And then if there's a constant inside, and there is, it's a negative one half, we have to divide by that constant. If I was taking the derivative, I'd have to multiply by negative one half. Since I'm taking the derivative or antiderivative, I have to divide by negative one half. Dividing by negative one half is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal, negative two over one. Substitute in one for v and v, well, four for v and subtract. The twos reduce. You end up with negative natural log of eight times e to the negative four over two. So that's e to the negative two minus e to the negative one half. 
or you could change the sign in here or flip the order. That's fine. Okay, so that's the value of our double integral. Okay, so that's how we use the Jacobian guys. If a transformation is given to you, and I found all those points of intersection at the beginning. Um, those points of intersection at the beginning might give us restrictions for these equations. So I said um, y equals 2x, and then we could have said y equals 2x where x ranges from root 2 over 2 to root 2, and then had a restricted value for this u equals 2 here. Um, so we have u equals 2 for v between some number and some other number. Um, I guess I just neglected to do that. I don't think it's necessary. Um, if this transformation that they gave us happened to not be a one-to-one -one transformation, we might be in trouble. We would need to, to take those bounds into consideration. We need to actually make sure that our transformation is one-to-one. -one. Um, but this is probably fine. If you just take each of those four curves separately and transform them into the new variables, that should do, that should give you the equations for the boundaries over here. Okay, so you get the, the new um, region of integration, you describe it in terms of u and v. You take your old integrand, you write it in terms of u and v using the transformation, and then you compute the new area piece. The new area piece is the Jacobian times du dv. The Jacobian is calculated this way. And remember, whatever the Jacobian is, you're always going to take the absolute value of that, the absolute value of that times du dv, that is the area piece. Let's do one more example, and then I'll show you the um, cylindrical or the um, spherical coordinates Jacobian that gives us that rho squared sine of phi. So let's say we've got the double integral over r of the square root of x plus y. And the region of integration is the triangle. It's an interior of a triangle. With certain vertices. Vertices are 0, 0, and let's say 4, 0, and uh, 0, 4. Okay. It actually isn't too bad in rectangular coordinates, honestly. It might not even be worth changing to another coordinate system, but let's, let's see what happens. So our triangle goes through 0, 0, x equals 4, y equals 0, and x equals 0, y equals 4. So that's the region R. Okay. Well, I can describe the region R in uh, rectangular coordinates if I know the equation of this line. The equation of that line is, well, it's given by y equals mx plus b. The slope is down 4 over 4, so it's negative 1. The y-intercept is 4. And then I've got y equals 0 as a bound down here. x equals 0 is another bound. Now, I notice right away that if I add x to both sides, I get x plus y equals 4. And that's nice, because the integrand is x plus y. Say, so, hey, that's a very, very nice thing. Um, so I've got x plus y equals 4 up here. And then we've got one bound down here. It's y equals 0. 
and then this bound over here is x equals zero. Hmm. What should our variables be? This one really doesn't even make sense um, as one that we would convert to a new coordinate system. I mean, the integrand could be more easily written if I let u equal x plus y, then that would just be a u to the one half. And then u would go from four to something else. But these other bounds, they wouldn't be very easily described in terms of the new variable. I guess let's 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 do the problem anyway and see what we get. Let's let u equal x plus y, and then I'll just let uh, v equal x. Why not? Okay, and then we will change each of these curves to a corresponding curve in terms of u and v. So given our transformation, x plus y equals 4 means that u equals 4. Here I've got x equals 0. Given my transformation, v equals x, that means v equals 0. And y equals 0, well that's not clear here. Um, but I can solve this system of equations for y by subtracting I'll take this equation and subtract this equation. Solving this for y, I get y equals u minus b. I'm doing this equation minus this equation. This is u minus v equals zero. Okay, so let's look at the transformed region. I don't really feel like it's gonna be that much simpler than the original one, but that's okay. v equals zero is down here on the u axis. Uh, u equals 4 is over here. And u minus v equals 0, that passes through 0, 0. I guess I could add a v to both sides and I get u equals v. Okay, so this is one where we don't have constant bounds. Not for both variables. <coughs> so we can integrate with respect to u first and then v, or with respect to v first and then u, either one is fine. I think I wanna integrate with respect to v first and then u. So v starts at zero, and it goes to this equation. And on that line, v is equal to u and vice versa. So v goes from zero to u, and u goes from zero to four. Okay. You might be saying to yourself, why are we switching to that? That doesn't really look that much simpler than that, and I agree. Um, but we're doing this for practice. So we've got our new bounds. And now we need a new integrand. Well, our original integrand was the square root of x plus y. And we chose u to be x plus y, so this is just the square root of u now, or u to the 1 half. Okay. There's our new integrand. And then the last thing we need is a new DA. So 
DA is absolute value of the Jacobian of the transformation times DU times DB. You can change the order if you want to. Um, and we have U equals X plus Y and V equals X. But we need X in terms of U and V and Y in terms of U and V. X is already written in terms of U and V. Instead of saying V equals X, I could just say X equals V. That'll work. And then if I take this equation and I subtract this equation, I can get Y by itself. So I have U minus V equals Y. And now we can compute our partials so that we can evaluate the Jacobian. The partial of X with respect to U is zero because there are no U's in it. Partial of X with respect to V is one. Partial of Y with respect to U is one. Partial of Y with respect to V is negative one. So the Jacobian is this. In the top row, we have a zero and a one. Bottom row, we have a negative one and a one. Then we do zero minus one. So we get negative one. That's funny. The area over here is exactly the same as the area up here. And it actually doesn't surprise me because look what did our change of, what did our change of variables do? It's just sort of changed that triangle to this triangle and they look pretty much the same. So we've got the absolute value of negative one times du dv. So it turns out that dx dy and du dv are exactly the same. Given the nature of our transformation, it doesn't surprise me that the Jacobian would be one. So that's our new DA. Okay, now we put all of those pieces together to evaluate the double integral. So now we're going to have bounds for the region S. Now, V goes from zero to U, so we have to integrate with respect to V first. And U goes from zero to four. The integrand was u to the one half, and dA was du dv or dv du. Since so we're integrating with respect to v first, we'll put the v first. You anti differentiate with respect to v. So you've got that constant times v. Substitute in v equals zero and v equals u and subtract. When v equals zero, we get zero. So you have u to the one half times u to the first. Add the exponents. Then we add one to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. Substitute in zero and four and subtract. And so you've got the square root of four raised to the fifth, because that's four to the five halves minus zero. So we've got two over five times two to the fifth, which is 32, to so get 64 over five. Or if you prefer 12.8. Okay, so it's pretty simple. New bounds, new integrand, new dA. In this case, I probably would have just integrated it in rectangular coordinates. It really wasn't that bad as it started, um, or with what we started with. Okay. Now, I promised you I would show you the Jacobian of the spherical coordinates transformation. Now, remember, in spherical coordinates, x equals rho sine of phi times cosine of theta y equals rho sine of phi times sine of theta, and z equals rho cosine of phi. And we want to use the Jacobian to show that dv is rho squared sine of phi times d rho d theta d phi. So really you're just showing that the absolute value of the Jacobian is this right here. 
So it's the Jacobian of x, y, and z with respect to rho, theta, and phi. And this is what we'll have. We'll have partials of x with respect to rho, theta, and phi, partials of y with respect to rho, theta, and phi, and partials of z with respect to rho, theta, oops, z, and phi. And this is going to be kind of long. There are going to be a lot of sine squared plus cosine squared is equal one by the time we're done, but then everything will simplify. <coughs> so I want the partial of x with respect to rho. This is a constant times rho. The derivative of a constant times rho is just the constant. And then we're taking the derivative of this with respect to theta. Derivative of cosine of theta is negative sine of theta. So we'll have negative rho sine of phi times sine of theta. And then we're taking the derivative of this with respect to phi. Derivative of sine of phi is cosine of phi. So we'll have rho cosine of phi times cosine of theta. Okay. Same thing for y. This is a constant times rho. The derivative of a constant times rho with respect to rho is just the constant. Derivative of this with respect to theta, that's a constant times sine of theta. Bring our constant down. The derivative of sine of theta is cosine of theta. And then we're taking the derivative with respect to phi. This is a constant times sine of phi. Um, derivative of sine of phi is cosine of phi. Then we take the derivative of this with respect to rho. That's a constant times rho, so we just get the constant. Then the derivative of this with respect to theta is zero. There are no thetas in it. It's all constant with respect to theta. And then the derivative of this with respect to phi, it's the derivative of cosine of phi is negative sine of phi. So we have that right there. Now, because I have a zero right here, I think I want to expand along this row when I evaluate my three by three determinant. So we have plus minus plus, pick up where you left off with the signs, minus plus minus, plus minus plus when you do your sign convention uh, for your um, cofactor expansion this determinant. So this says plus, we should use um, the positive, positive one times this. And then we cross out the row and column containing this element. And we look at the two by two determinant that's left. So we've got negative row, sine of phi, sine of theta, row cosine of phi, cosine of theta, row sine of phi, cosine of theta, and rho cosine of phi, sine of theta. So I've crossed out this row and this column, and I've got that two by two determinant. I'll evaluate that in a minute. Minus zero times a two by two, but it doesn't matter because we're going to multiply it by zero. So that's gone. Plus negative rho sine of phi times the two by two determinant that results when I cross out this row and this column. So I've got that guy, like these guys right here. I don't know why I like to personify my functions, but I do. Let's see. Actually, I know exactly where I got that. I got that from this tutor that I worked with in the math lab named Will Harwood. I don't think Will will ever watch this, but if you're watching, hi, Will. He personified functions, and I just picked that up from him. Okay. Now, I claim that this simplifies to at least um, something that has an absolute value of rho squared sine of phi. So let's, let's prove it. This is, of course, zero, and that first two by two determinant can be um, computed this way. 
you multiply across this diagonal first. So I've got negative rho times rho is negative rho squared. Sine of phi, cosine of phi. And sine of theta times sine of theta is sine squared theta. When people make mistakes on this problem, it's usually because they're not keeping track of this, uh, the phi's and the thetas correctly. You know, watch that. Then you're subtracting this times this. You're subtracting rho times rho, that's rho squared. Sine of phi, cosine of phi. Cosine times cosine is cosine squared theta. Same thing down here. We have minus rho sine of phi times, multiply across that diagonal, rho sine of phi times sine of phi is sine squared phi, cosine theta times cosine theta is cosine squared theta. Hmm. And then we're subtracting a negative, so that's going to mean that we're adding rho times sine of phi times sine of phi. So that's sine squared phi and sine theta times sine theta, so sine squared theta. Now we're always hoping, when we see all these trig functions, that we can factor something out and we're going to see sine squared plus cosine squared is one, where the angles are the same. Um, so I'm looking at this expression in red and hoping for something that I can factor out from this term and this term. And I see I've got a negative rho squared sine of phi cosine of phi there and another one over there. So I can factor that out from both of these guys and I'll be left with a sine squared plus cosine squared. That's very nice. And then I look over here and I see I can factor out sine, or, uh, rho sine squared phi and rho sine squared phi. And if I do, I'm left with a cosine squared and a sine squared. So it's very good. So let's actually do that. I'm just going to try to emphasize what I'm factoring out. I'm factoring out this piece. Oh, whoops, I'm factoring out this piece. <laughs> and I'm factoring out this piece. So I've got negative rho squared sine phi cosine of phi. Oops. And then I'm left with sine squared plus cosine squared of theta. The angles are the same. So that's one. And then down here, I've got this. And these guys have a rho sine squared phi in common. And I'm left with cosine squared plus sine squared over there. Both have the same angle. That's good, so that's a one. Still hoping for some cancellations. I've got negative rho squared sine of phi Cosine times cosine is cosine squared phi. Down here, I've got a negative rho times a rho is negative rho squared. And then I've got sine of phi times sine squared phi. That's sine cubed phi. So I'm looking at these two guys and I say to myself, what do they have in common? I think they've got a negative rho sine squared or sine of phi in common. So I say to myself, this times what gives me this first term? Cosine squared phi will work. And this times what gives me the second term? I took out one of the signs. I'm still left with two of them. There's a sine squared phi over here. And the angles are the same. So we get negative rho squared sine of phi as our Jacobian. Now, according to our formulas, dv is the absolute value of the Jacobian with respect to rho theta and phi times d rho d theta d phi. So the absolute value wipes out that negative sign and we get rho squared sine of phi times d rho d theta d phi. Okay guys, that's it for the Jacobian. Briefly, what do you need? You need three things. 
you need new bounds, you need a new integrand, and you need a new DA or a new DB. Um, so you take this double integral over R. You write the bounds in terms of U and V. That usually involves um, taking equations involving X and Y and transforming them into equations in terms of U and V, and then sketching the corresponding rectangle or triangle or region in the UV plane, and then finding bounds for that region. Then you take the integrand that they gave you and you write it in terms of U and V. And then DA is the absolute value of the Jacobian times DU DV, and you can change the order if you want to. And I think that that's really cool because that means instead of integrating over that, which is a pain, I get to integrate over that. Or instead of integrating over that, which is definitely a pain, I can integrate over that. Now on this one, I can integrate over that or that, and it really doesn't matter either way. It didn't help that much, but we could still do it. Um, and everything that we've talked about, um, I focus primarily on functions of two variables but it extends to functions of three variables. Um, we have a Jacobian for transformations that go from three variables to three new variables, and that works in pretty much the same way. So your dv piece from the original variables, dx, dy, and dz, is equal to the Jacobian of x, y, and z with respect to the new variables, in this case, rho, theta, and phi, times d rho, d theta, d phi. If this was a u, v, and w, you would have a du, dv, and dw over there. 